Hello, my name is Robert Dandeweijn. I'm a professor in rheumatology in the Netherlands, and I was chair of ULAR Standing Committee for the Quality of Care and have been leading five successive ULAR sets of recommendations on the management of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And that is actually what we are going to talk about, the steroid use in rheumatoid arthritis and the ULAR view. Long-term low-dose glucocorticoids are frequently used in rheumatoid arthritis, even despite the availability of many very successful biological or targeted synthetic DMARDs. And this is reflected by the fact that, that more than 40% of patients worldwide still use steroids in spite of the fact that they also use other effective DMARDs, biological and targeted synthetic DMARDs. But steroids have the connotation of long-term adverse events, high blood pressure, cardiovascular mobility, infections, osteoporosis, weight gain, cataract, you're very familiar with that. And recently, the ACR has recommended against the use of steroids in rheumatoid arthritis because of the fear for adverse events. And ULAR seems to be a little bit more lenient and allows low-dose bridging steroids, and low-dose is defined as 7.5 milligrams per day or lower for the shortest possible time. So you may wonder why. I'll give you three different arguments. First of all, steroids are very effective drugs, especially as bridging therapy before a conventional synthetic or a biological DMARD will start working. And many trials have shown, in fact, that steroids decrease disease activity, inhibit radiographic progression, and perhaps especially increase the quality of life. So steroids may do a little bit more than only suppressing inflammation. Second argument. Steroids in low dosages seem to be relatively safe. In fact, trials and meta-analyses of trials have suggested that some adverse events occur more frequently, even statistically significantly more frequently, but the real impact is rather low and rather manageable. At least in Europe, data have shown that at least 80% of the patients on steroid bridging therapy can stop the steroids between let's say three and six months. Third argument, observational studies seem to be more worrisome, but the interpretation of observational studies is importantly hampered by confounding or bias by indication. And that is the phenomenon that the worst RA patients with the worst prognosis anyway, will preferably be treated with long-term steroids. So in other words, you are things it is the disease rather than the drug that, cause, that causes most harm in those studies. So to summarize, steroids are effective drugs in RA. Toxicity seems to be manageable, and a lot of presumed toxicity is due to methodological artifacts in studies. This does not mean that ULAR propagates steroid use in general, but rather that at ULAR we value the merits of short-term lowest possible steroid dose, and that is why we still have steroids in our EULA recommendations. But shortest possible term of the shortest possible term of administration and the lowest possible dosage still remains key. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Brian England, rheumatologist at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And today we're going to discuss glucocorticoids in the 2021 ACR RA treatment guidelines. Let's start with what are these recommendations? Now, there are three recommendations in the ACR RA treatment guidelines that pertain to glucocorticoids. Two of these recommendations are in the situation where we're newly starting disease modifying therapy. And one of these recommendations is for patients who are already on disease modifying therapy and glucocorticoids. But let's start at the beginning. Let's start when we're newly initiating disease modifying therapies. There is a conditional recommendation to initiate disease modifying therapies without short-term glucocorticoid use, with short-term being defined as less than three months. And there is a strong recommendation to initiate disease-modifying therapies without longer-term glucocorticoid use, with longer-term here being defined as greater than three months of planned glucocorticoid use. Now, for those patients who are already on disease-modifying therapies and glucocorticoids, and they need those glucocorticoids to stay at target, there's a conditional recommendation to optimize their disease-modifying regimen rather than continuing glucocorticoids to keep our patients at target. So how did we get to these recommendations? 
let's look at both the benefits and the potential harms of glucocorticoids. So the benefits. Well, clearly glucocorticoids improve symptoms and disease activity, as well as progress disease-modifying properties with slowing radiographic progression. What providers and patients perhaps like most about glucocorticoids is their quick uh, onset of action. The ultimate result for our patients is that it allows them to return back to activities to help them care for themselves or care for others and return to work more quickly. But there are also harms of glucocorticoids that have been well established. These include the impact on bone loss resulting in osteopenia and osteoporosis and ultimately compression fractures and hip fractures. Glucocorticoids increase the risk of infection, hyperglycemia, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, mental health, and disrupt sleep. In fact, many of these toxicities uh, have a dose and duration dependent relationship with glucocorticoid use. But what's also emerged over the last few years in the literature is that we start to see these toxicities of glucocorticoids at even lower doses and shorter periods of use than we previously thought. Another consideration is that in the real world setting, it's often difficult for patients to get off steroids in a timely manner, resulting in prolonged use or prolonged higher dose use. So the voting panel and the patient panel considered these benefits and they considered these harms, and that ultimately is what led to those recommendations we just discussed. Now let's talk about how we might apply these, and let's go through a few different patient situations. Patient number one, this is a newly diagnosed RA patient, has four swollen joints, six tender joints, and a CDI score of 19. This patient makes near a full fist and has preserved grip strength. They're not having any difficulties caring for themselves or their family, and they work an office job that's currently not prohibited by their symptoms. Now, according to the guidelines, this is a patient that we would start disease-modifying therapy in without using glucocorticoids. Now, patient number two, this is a newly diagnosed RA patient. Now, this patient has 10 swollen joints and 10 tender joints. Their CDI score is 34. This patient can't make a full fist, and you can detect some reduced grip strength on your exam. They also tell you about some difficulty doing the buttons on their shirt or holding a utensil. And they work as a carpenter and currently are off work because of the difficulties from the disease. So this is a patient, according to the guidelines, where we would start disease-modifying therapy with low-dose short-term glucocorticoid use. So even though short-term glucocorticoid use is conditionally recommended against in the guidelines, this is the patient where the conditions you know, exist that it's better for this person to receive short-term glucocorticoid use. Now, our third patient is an RA patient who's transferring care. They were diagnosed about two years ago. Their disease-modifying regimen includes methotrexate 15 milligrams orally each week hydroxychloroquine 200 milligrams daily, and then they've also needed prednisone five milligrams daily to stay under good disease control. A few times they've tried to stop prednisone and each time they've had a flare up, most recently one year ago. Today on your exam, there's no swollen joints, there's no tender joints, their CDI scores too. So according to the guidelines, this is a patient where we want to taper their glucocorticoids off, but clearly they've demonstrated that that's been difficult to do without modifying their disease uh, modifying regimen. So this is a patient we want to optimize their DMARDs to allow us to taper them off of glucocorticoids. So in summary, there are three recommendations for glucocorticoids in the RA treatment guidelines from the ACR. Conditionally recommend against short-term glucocorticoids when we start disease-modifying therapy. Strong recommendation against longer-term glucocorticoids, meaning more than three months when initiating disease-modifying therapy and a conditional recommendation to optimize our DMARDs rather than stay on glucocorticoids to keep an RA patient at target. And the bottom line here is that steroids should not be the default in rheumatoid arthritis. We should not be systematically prescribing glucocorticoids to our RA patients, but rather we should be evaluating these patients carefully and finding the patient that really needs acute symptom relief as a bridge to, to their most effective disease-modifying regimen. In those situations, it's critical that when we use glucocorticoids, we use them at the lowest dose and for the shortest period of time necessary. And ultimately, our best long-term outcomes in rheumatoid arthritis, those result from us optimizing disease-modifying therapy and not over-relying on glucocorticoids. 
Thanks for joining us today for this discussion of glucocorticoids and the ACR RA treatment guidelines. Hi, everyone. My name is Professor Peter Nash from the School of Medicine, Griffith University in beautiful downtown Brisbane in Queensland in Australia. And today we're talking about some difficult issues in the management of rheumatoid arthritis. One of my pet areas to think about is the controversy between the ACR and the EULA recent updated recommendations for management when they're talking about how to use low-dose corticosteroid. The ACR chose not to recommend it and the uh, EULA recommendations were to continue to recommend low-dose oral prednisone, although to be fair, they don't they don't specify whether it should be oral, but it can be intramuscular, which is what we're trying to get to. Reason I bring it up is another presentation at ULAR in Milan by Croson and his colleagues, and they looked at the RA population in two cohorts, one from 1999 to 2008 and another from 2009 to 2020. And they looked to see how we rheumatologists have been using steroids in our RA populations. And guess what? We're still using them, and we're using them more than we used to use them, even though we have a tremendous array of very effective therapies that are steroid sparers, so that 71% of patients are started on steroids. They're usually started orally. These people have more comorbidities, are more likely to be on a biologic at the end of 12 months. But even though the guidelines in EULA say off by three months, I've always found it very difficult to get people off the last few milligrams of prednisone. And I've also found that occasionally, more than I'd like, once the person has the bottle of prednisone in their hand, they take a fistful when they're sore, then stop when they're feeling well, they're good for a week, then they flare, and then they're on the roller coaster. And it's very hard to control their disease while they continue to do that. The point that this particular poster made was that the more likely to start steroid if you're older, you're uh, less likely to come off if you're older. Smokers are also much less likely to discontinue steroids. But the key point was 30% of patients are still on glucocorticoids at two years, exactly the same as the catch cohort from Canada that was a paper from many years ago. And we're now seeing lots of publications. Martin Bors has recently published the glorious study and there's another recent publication in the Annals of Internal Medicine this month talking about, firstly, the Annals said that low-dose steroids puts on 1.1 kilos over a year over a year or two. And it, it also talked about um, increase in, minor increases in blood pressure, which may well have relevance over time. And Martin Bors is saying how safe it is to use steroids in that population, even though there was more osteoporotic fractures, there was uh, more people hospitalized with infections, et cetera, et cetera. So the bottom line is I'm very keen to use as bridging therapy corticosteroids, but intra-articular or injected rather than commence low-dose oral. What do you think? The evidence is out there on the efficacy of um, intramuscular and intraarticular steroid injection, and the evidence is out there of how difficult it is to get some patients off their low-dose steroid and the long-term uh, effects of steroid use, driving weight gain, blood pressure, infection in particular, fatty liver, metabolic syndrome, premature atherosclerosis, etc. Thanks for your attention.